I want to say good morning to James Huggins Sr. James, um, I want you to know how much I appreciate you logging on uh, when you have time and when you do. Um, fond memories of times, times already passed. Uh, Don Neiman, uh, good to see you online this morning also. These are on Facebook, folks. We've got about three and a half minutes before we begin. Good morning, Connie Epsher. Good morning, Eddie Gallo. Eddie's from Las Vegas. Uh, Jasmine Varro is from the Philippines. Good to see you, Connie. Good morning, Ford and Judy. Ford and Judy Sinley in, um, in Little Rock. Judy has been with me since 1970. Ford has been with me just shortly after that. Uh, good morning, uh, Marilyn Thornhill. Marilyn is a Bible teacher, teaches ladies, uh, ladies groups. Wonderful lady. Got about two minutes before we begin. Should I be able to hear you? Mm hmm. I can't hear you. Okay, just a second. Okay, we had a, a local a local person that was not able to hear, and you're not getting anything at all? Recording in progress. Okay, folks, the Word of God is alive and powerful. Yes, it is. And it's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow and is a critic of the thoughts and intents of the heart. All Scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be mature, thoroughly furnished into all good works. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly di dividing the word of truth. Now, let's take just a moment of time to prepare ourselves for the study of God's word through the technique of rebound and operation cry. 
you, you understand that. So with your heads bowed and eyes closed, you make your own way with the Lord through the confession of your own personal sins. I'll close out our prayer time. I'll make an announcement or two, and we'll pick up our study right where we left off in the last session. Father, I don't know how else to say it. it. Sounds like a broken record. But my desire as a pastor teacher is not just to sort of lollygag my way through my pastorate. Not just to fiddle around and do whatever I'm supposed to do. But I want to teach the word of God, Father. I want to stand strong. I want to stand firm in the truth. Because there are many people that are listening to my ministry that need the kind of information that you've placed in your Bible, in your word. And when we're looking at all the problems that we face today, the corruption that we face all around, the question is, are we going to be, are we going to be consumed by all that? Or are we going to do the right thing because we are a vital part of the angelic conflict? and the resolution of that conflict. So without the word of God, there is no word from God. I think we need to understand that, Father. Without the word of God, there is no word from you. There's no way that we can handle the circumstances of life. So I want to I, I wanna make sure that every person that logs on, whether it's through Facebook, whether it's through YouTube, whether it's through Zoom, that those folks that are Tuning in will understand that Christianity is not just some sort of religious thing out there, but it's a spiritual life that we begin the moment we're saved. Oh yes, we're saved eternally. We can't lose our salvation. But the question is, how are we living our Christian way of life? Father, I've got a diagram on my head that I want, to, I want to share with our folks sometime in the near future. Because many of our folks may be, in fact, living in the sphere of the Spirit, but without a sufficient amount of doctrine. There's no way that we'll ever reach spiritual maturity, and that's the status that you want us in. Taking on the life of Christ, transformed into his likeness, the likeness of his humanity. It's not a joke. It's not just some foolish kind of thing out here called a religion. No. This is the spiritual way of life. And how we handle our lives now will actually reflect on, our, on ourselves, on our being, throughout all of eternity. So may the Spirit of God teach us this morning in Christ's name. Amen. I want to thank all of you for logging on. The, the subject this morning is going to be Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. What a verse of scripture. The, the book of Philippians has been one of, the, one of the best books that I've ever taught in my life. And it's just because it comes to grips with what the Christian way of life really is. It's not just a matter of going through some form, uh, going, into, going into, into a local assembly somewhere simply because this is what you're supposed to do. Uh, just, uh, you know, this is, I'm obligated to do this, so I just do this. Well, the question is, are we learning anything when we're there? And sad to say, beloved pro folks, very little was I ever taught from a pulpit after I was saved. Very little, as far as the Christian way of life is concerned. Well, with that in mind, let me let me move on here. July 9th, uh, 2023, that's the second Sunday of July, we'll be meeting back down at the uh, American Pie Pizza. So uh, if you feel like you're going to attend or you think you're going to attend, send me a note and I will, um, I will uh, put you on the list and make sure that you have a seat and also notes. Now let me uh, let me make another comment here. Uh, this coming this coming Wednesday, I said I'm uh, recording in progress. Well, it's already in progress. Yes, I just had something come up on my screen here again. Okay. 
Well, anyway, if you're not if you're not hearing me, let me know. Um, this coming Wednesday, Daryl will teach for the final time, as we had asked him to take my place during my recovery from surgery. And looking back on nearly 60 years of pastoral work, pastoral ministry, this past session where I had to leave because of the surgery is the only time in my memory when in nearly 60 years I have ever missed a service because of illness. And for that, I'm, I'm very grateful. Jim, I don't know if you can hear us. Yes, I can. But we're not, I'm not seeing any video. Okay, well, thanks, Daryl. Uh, I had something pop up on my screen here just a few minutes ago. and uh, No video or your audio. Okay, you are hearing the audio? Are you hearing the audio? Okay, Janet said she isn't either. Uh, no, we're what? not here. I'm hearing the audio on the iPhone. Okay, on the no. iPhone, but not on the computer. No audio, no video. Okay, just a second. It was all working to begin with. Okay, let me see here. Okay, no video. Let me share the screen again. Okay, let's see. Are you seeing it now, Daryl? All right, now we've got the video. Okay. Okay, well, let's, uh, let me go back and make, make this comment again. Daryl will be teaching this coming Sunday, and I want to thank him for picking up the, um, the slack when I was out for the surgery. But this coming Sunday, we'll go back to the original format. I'll be teaching on Sunday and Wednesday, as long as the Lord will allow. Right now, I'm just about as healthy as you could be, and uh, I just want to thank the Lord for all that, and thank Daryl for uh, subbing for me, and I want to thank all of you for staying with us during that period of time. Now, let's get on. Let's get back here to this this passage of Scripture, Philippians 4:4. 4. In it, by way of a brief review, notice what Paul is saying in verse 1, 2, and 3. He said, therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, and that therefore, in that first, that first word in verse 1, is actually a, uh, a, uh, a foundation for what Paul is about to say based on what he had just said in Philippians 3, verses 17 through the end of that chapter. So he says, therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, he's talking to the Philippian born-again believers, and he's talking to you and me today, he says, whom I long to see. He's in prison at this point in time because he's, a, because he's been teaching about Jesus. And he had been in Philippi and teaching there. He knew these people, and he, would, he really wanted to go back. He wanted to see them again. And he says, whom I long to see, and that was deep passion. He said, my joy and my crown. These people are growing to Christian maturity, and I want you to know that if you reach Christian maturity, if you reach spiritual maturity in your life under my ministry, when I stand before the Bema Seat of Christ, I will receive a crown. You are that crown. You will be my crown based on the fact. Now, you're not going to be sitting on my head. This is just a recognition of the fact that under my ministry, you have reached spiritual maturity. Now, spiritual maturity is not just going to church. Spiritual maturity is being transformed into the likeness of the humanity of Christ, speaking like he speaks in every circumstance, thinking like he thinks, feeling like he would feel, and doing as he would have done or would do in your circumstances. You will be my crown. That's just one type of crown. Then he says to you and me, all of us, he said, stand firm. That means once you get to spiritual maturity, or wherever you are, don't go backwards. That's reversionism. And he doesn't want us to go in that direction. He wants us to stand firm. His desire is for us to reach spiritual maturity, that we might have the greatest effectiveness for him and his plan for the human race, 
in our life. Stand firm, stand firm in the Lord. You can't stand firm if you're not in the Lord. That means you're saved. That's positional truth. You're in Christ now. You're no longer in Adam. He said, stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. Then he goes on in verse 2 and says, hey, we got a problem there in the church at Philippi, in the body of Christ. He said, we got a problem there. So he said, I urge you, Odia, and I urge Syntyche, these are two ladies, who are very, very helpful to Paul in his ministry. And I'd indicated last Sunday that you may be, you may be out here doing all kinds of good deeds for the Lord in your ministry, whatever that ministry happens to be. But if you are out of fellowship with God while you're doing it, it is, it is of no value to you in time or eternity. You don't lose your salvation. So he's saying, look, I want, I want you, Odia and Syntyche, to live in harmony in the Lord. Now, the way you live in harmony is for both of us, or you and I, these two ladies, living in a mature status in the likeness of Jesus Christ. So he said, I want you to live in harmony. Now, what happened is, he said, okay, now how's that going to happen? So he says, indeed, true companion, we do not know who that is. Speculation. I called this verse the verse of speculation. We don't know who, it, who that is. He said, I also, I ask you also, true companion, help these women. Do whatever is necessary to get these ladies back in fellowship with one another. Because here's what he said they did. Who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel. In other words, Paul is preaching the gospel of Christ. He's giving, these, he's giving the people to whom he's speaking and addressing the gospel of Christ, which is the gospel of grace. There is no works that any human being can do in order to be saved. It's a grace, it's a grace model. In, in other words, Jesus Christ has done all the work. We just believe in the work that he has done. The death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. Nothing else. No baptism, join the church, walk an aisle, no, no. None of that. It's believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. That is, believing in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. That's the gospel of Paul. That's his gospel. So he said, uh, these people have actually uh, helped me in my, in my ministry, together with Clement, as well as the rest of my fellow workers. We don't know who any of those people are. Have a name, but with, it's all speculation. But Paul says, look, these people have been, have been involved in my ministry. They've helped. And I want to see uh, Euodia and Syntyche living in harmony once again. Then he goes on to say something about these people. It's important that you understand this. Together with Clement, as well as the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. Now, that can be a little, uh, a little difficult, a little deceptive there, because most Christians today believe that the moment you get saved... Your name is in the Lamb's Book of Life. But that's not so. The entire human race has their name in the Lamb's Book of Life. But the truth of the matter is, you don't get your name in the book when you get saved. You get your name taken out of the book when you die, having never believed in Jesus Christ as your Savior. These people all are, are, are believers. He says their names are in the Book of Life. That mean, I take that to mean they are eternally there. The omniscience of God knows that. But then in verse 4, listen to this please. In verse 4, Paul says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And I've emboldened and capitalized that word always. It's not that way in, in the scripture. But I capitalized that to call your attention to this. So that in the angelic conflict... Every moment, every second of our life, we need to be rejoicing in the Lord, whatever that means, and I will talk about that. But we need to be doing this all the time, and we need to do it without regard to what kind of circumstances we happen to be in. He said, rejoice in the Lord always. This is a command. This is not just, hey, you know, if, uh, if you have time, uh, give some thought to this problem you're having. having. Give, some, give some thought to this uh, pressure that you happen to be under, whatever it happens to be. 
And I will guarantee you, every one of us, if I just called your name, every one of us have problems that may differ from somebody else. You have your own special problems, your pressures in life. And then we may have pressures that are very similar. Gas prices the same for everybody. For example, the uh, the cost of the cost of food is going to be about uh, relatively the same for everybody. So there are similar similar problems we have, pressures that we have. But every one of us may have something a little different. Listen, uh, not everybody that's listening to my ministry here didn't recently have maxillofacial surgery, but I did. So the issue is, what are we going to do with this? And Paul said, look, here's the issue. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. And when Paul says, again I say rejoice, what's he doing here? He's simply emphasizing the fact that this is the attitude that he wants us to have. Now, I want to take that word rejoicing for just a minute and say... Let me interrupt again. Yes, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm still not hearing audio on the Zoom. Not hearing audio on the Zoom. Hmm. Now I did. You just <laughs> turned your mic on. Now I hear. Okay, got it. Okay. The uh, this idea here of rejoicing. What it, what does it mean to rejoice? Rejoicing is a regenerate Christian. Now I had a chat with Doc, uh, with Daryl the other night about this. And uh, I use the term regenerate Christian. This is, this is a, a person who is truly, has truly believed that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he was born of a virgin, and specifically that he died, was buried, and resurrected on our behalf to pay for the sins of the world. Now, that's a regenerate Christian. But when I look out here and see what's going on in the multitude of assemblies calling themselves Christians. These are truly not born-again Christians, and the reason I'm able to say that is because if they're believing what that group teaches, it's impossible for them to be saved. And yet they call themselves Christians. Now what happens is you and I are raised in this culture, in this society, and we know that we're, we, we've learned that we call these people Christians. We call them Christians. But these are people who are not truly born-again Christians. So I want to make a distinction so that when, you're, when I'm talking with you, I'm not just talking about anybody out there that's going to church. I want you to understand that there are those out there that are going to church and going to hell and going to the lake of fire. They may not even go to church. They call themselves Christians, whatever, for whatever reason. But they're not truly regenerate Christians. So what I want you to understand is that rejoicing is a regenerate Christian's favorable mental attitude. So you have this regenerate Christian. Let's suppose that you're saved. I'm, I'm assuming that you are. Let's say that you're truly saved. You have to decide that. But if you are truly saved, you are a regenerate Christian, and the question is, what is your mental attitude, and what is your emotional response to the circumstances that you find yourself in? Please understand, this is crucial. This is crucial to what the Christian way of life is all about. Now, let me point this out. If you don't agree with that, you go someplace else and find somebody else to teach you what you think is correct, and all that's going to come out at the Bema Seat and or the Great White Throne Judgment, depending upon whether you're truly saved or not. But you see, we have to have a favorable mental attitude and emotional response in every circumstance of life. So what happens is, rejoicing is that mental attitude and emotional response of gratitude. In other words, you are a born again Christian and you are gr you are grateful to God for what you have, for who you are, for what he is, for what he's providing, what he's going to provide for you in every circumstance of life, in time and in eternity. You've come to the point of uh, of life, the point in your life where you actually understand what life is all about. You understand the angelic conflict. You understand your role in this conflict. 
you understand how to rightly divide the word of God. You're not living out of the Old Testament. You're not living out of the Gospels. You're living out of the Pauline epistles where you have, where he has exposed and given to us the mystery doctrine of the age of grace, a, a set of rules that have never heretofore been told to anybody until the Apostle Paul came along. So the question is, when you're looking at this rat's nest that we're living in, when you're looking at the cosmos diabolicus, the devil's world, when you're looking at this mess that we're living in, this septic tank of life, the question is, if you are affected by the circumstances of life, how are you handling that? What is your mental attitude? What is your emotional response? And I can tell you for a fact that having, having, uh, having looked at the 14 times that, that Israel complained and griped and bellyached and moaned and groaned and marabod regarding their circumstance of life, I will guarantee you that a large number of Christians, and perhaps maybe some who are even listening to me, have not yet have not yet completely understood what this thing is about maraboying, griping, complaining. And I would like for all of us to take a look at our life what are we thinking? What are we saying? What are we feeling? What are we doing in our circumstance that might exactly be mimicking what the Jews were doing, the Israelites were doing, every time they got to a new situation and didn't have exactly what they wanted? What did they do? They griped, uh, they, gripe, they marabob, they complained, they worried, they bellyached, and God said, look, this is not the attitude. Paul's telling us, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Look, right now, look at the circumstances of your life. What is going on in your life right now? Whoever you are. And ask yourself, do you have a favorable mental attitude? Are you grateful to God for your circumstances right now? And if you're not, there's something wrong with your spiritual life at that point in time. Because God has given us the capacity to handle every circumstance of life with a positive mental attitude of rejoicing, with a positive m emotional response. And what is it? What we're doing is we are grateful to God for all that he has provided. There is the gratitude for what he has done in the past, what he's doing for us today, in spite of our circumstance. So we have a mental and emotional response of gratitude toward God. He's the author of it all. He's the one that's providing it. What's he providing? For the abundance of grace. These are things that we do not earn, we do not deserve, but God in the middle of the angelic conflict, seeing us there, is going to make the kind of provision for us that is actually going to be, uh, be a very positive thing to enable us to grow, to grow in Christ in order to enable us to uh, to uh, honor and glorify Him in the midst of our circumstance, so we're going to be we're going to be uh, gracious. We're filled with gratitude because of the abundance of grace provided by God to the one who is rejoicing. That should be you under every type of circumstance, without regard to whether the circumstance is good or bad. And so, what I've done here is I've taken two little diagrams. Good circumstances. What is it? It's not, it's not hard to rejoice. Hope. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you. I praise you, Father. Yes, it's wonderful. I, I've got this wonderful attitude. Nothing wrong in my life right now. My my mind is at peace. Oh, I just I'm I'm honoring you, Father, with everything I say and do. It's because of the good circumstances. But what happens when the circumstances turn sour? This circle right here with bad circumstances, we could make that a green circle and indicating indicating that you are functioning in the sphere of the spirit, but you can't you can't be there uh, you can't be there if you're not rejoicing. See, you can have bad circumstances and good circumstances while you're functioning in the sphere of the spirit, while you're living from the source of your old uh, your new man and or you new woman. And by the way. I need to make this statement. There's no such a thing as a spiritual transgender in the Christian way of life. In other words, you can't be a, you can't be a woman trying to be a man. Can't be a man trying to be a woman. No, that's not that's that's not 
That's not God's plan. So Paul's telling us here to rejoice in both good and bad circumstances. I'm asking you, are you actually doing this? Well, what we're going to see here now for just a moment, I'm going to turn to another passage of Scripture, and I want to look at, um, at, the, uh, at Luke, and uh, let's see, that's going to be right here, okay? I want to get Luke chapter 10, verses 1 through, 1 through 20, and I actually read this on, uh, on last Sunday. But it was near the end of the service, and what we're going to see is that Jesus is rejoicing also. Jesus knew how to rejoice. He's teaching us how to rejoice in every circumstance of life. So we're going to see that one of these occasions when Jesus was actually rejoicing himself and found out, find out why it is that he is rejoicing. Beginning in Luke chapter 10, verse 1, it says, Now, after this... The Lord appointed 72 others. Now, here's, a, here's another issue. In some versions of the Bible, it says 70. This one says 72. This is the New American Standard. Other versions of the Bible say 70. Well, whether it's 70 or 72 at this point in time, we can handle that. We know that the, uh, that the original manuscripts are perfect. Original manuscripts are perfect. But you may read from the King James Version, the New American Standard, the RSV, whatever, the Good News Translation. Uh, we could read from various versions of the Bible. And there may be, there may be areas in these Bibles where there, is, where there is a difference. This is one of them. Some versions say 70. This one says 72. What we're going to see here is Jesus is appointing 72 people other than himself. And he's going to send them in pairs to go here, to go there, to go someplace else. And remember now, this is in his ministry, earthly ministry now. He's, he's eventually going to get to the cross and die for the sins of the world, be buried and resurrected three days later, ascend into heaven, be seated at the right hand of God the Father. But this is during his public ministry. And he's going to visit certain cities. But before he gets there, he's going to send his disciples, ahead, 72 of them, or 70 of them, ahead of him in pairs of two each, two go here, two go there, two go someplace else, and sent them in pairs ahead of him to every city and place where he himself was going to come. So he's sending them to evangelize. Now hold it right here. We need to understand again that we are talking in the Gospel of Luke. We are still in the age of Israel. So the Gospel that Jesus is, t is sending them to teach is the Gospel of the Kingdom, not the Gospel of Grace. Because at this point in time, they're believing, and I have a timeline that, uh, that Daryl shared with me, and um, we got it from another pastor, but a timeline that, that says this very well, and I'll show this to you sometime in the near future. But the point is this, that they're not preaching the gospel of grace. They're not out there telling people that he's going to die, be buried, and resurrected. That's not it. What they're telling them, telling them is the kingdom is near, and we need to get ready, and you need to believe that this Jesus is your Messiah. So it says, and he was saying to them, the harvest is plentiful. Huh. There are many people out there that need to be saved. They need to come to, to grips with who I am. They need to, they need to have a, a certainty of what they're a positive uh, eternal destiny. So he said, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Hey, and I'm only one person. He said, but I'll tell you what, I'm going to send you out there and I want you to be preaching this gospel ahead of me. Therefore, Plead with the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. He's telling this 70 to go and plead for more. Why? The kingdom is, the kingdom is at hand. It's near. So he said, go, behold, I am sending you like lambs into the midst of wolves. Well, hello, we see that happening today also. If you as a born-again Christian are out there preaching the truth, pleading with others, about the gospel of Christ, pleading, on, pleading with them to turn their lives over to Christ to be saved eternally. But what's, what's happening? He said, you are like a lamb, and I'm sending you into the midst of wolves. 
And when you take a look today at what's happening in our country and what's happening around the world where Christians are in fact being persecuted because of who they are, what they are, the message that they, what they speak. He said, look, he, what, ha what happens? You put a lamb in with the wolves, what happens? The wolves are going to eat that lamb. They're going to kill that lamb. They're going to be persecuting that lamb. See, that's what happened to you and me. When we're preaching the truth in this society that we have in the culture that we have right now. And Jesus said, look, let me tell you what. He says, carry no money, no money belt, no bag, no sandals, and greet no one along the way. Well... That means you're going to have to trust him, aren't they? He said, in whatever house you enter, first say, peace be to this house. And if a man of peace is there, in other words, if the home that you go into, if this man's a peaceful man, he said, your peace will rest upon him. But if you go into this house and his, you don't have a man of peace there, but if not, it will return to you. Now watch this. Stay in that house, eating and drinking what they provide, for the laborer is deserving of his wages. Do not move from house to house. You get in one, stay there. He said, whatever city you enter and they receive you, eat what is served to you, and heal those in it who are sick, and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. See, at this point in time, Jesus is going to finish his ministry. And as far as the, the Jews are concerned, the kingdom will be established seven years later because that's the seven years of the tribulation that God gave to them but had not yet been fulfilled. So they knew there are seven, years, the seven more years out here. So it's only seven years till Jesus is going to establish the kingdom here on earth. But what they didn't realize was the rejection of the Israelites to the plan of God for them. God is going to insert into the timeline this period of time that we call the age of grace. But at that point in time, the kingdom could have been established. The kingdom of God has come near to you. He says then, but whatever city you enter and they do not receive you, Go out into the streets and say, if you go into a city and they don't receive you, he said, here's what you do. You say, even the dust of your city. We're talking about this. They're out on the street. They're telling people this. Even the dust of your city, which clings to our feet, we wipe off in protest against you. Why? They hadn't believed that Jesus is the Messiah. Yet be sure of this. The kingdom of God has come near. Yeah, it is. It's near. Then he says, I say to you, it will be more tolerable on the day of Sodom for that city. In other words, if you go into a city and they reject you, listen, it'll be, wor it'll be worse for them than it was for Sodom. And how, how God actually dealt with Sodom and Gomorrah. Then he says in verse 13, Woe to you, Chorazin. This is a city where, where uh, he had been rejected, the people had been rejected. Woe to you, Bethsaida. There's rejection there, rejection of the people that are coming. For if the miracles that occurred in you had occurred in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the judgment than for you. God's telling them, look, this is desperate. What's, what's happening in your life if you don't understand who Jesus Christ is? And we're talking, we're talking in the age of Israel here, but in the age of grace, we've got the same thing. People who are denying Jesus, rejecting Jesus, it's eternal condemnation in the lake of fire, separation from God. So in verse 15, he says, And you, Capernaum, you will not be exalted in heaven to heaven, will you? That's a rhetorical question. You will be brought down to Hades. There's the answer. No, it's not going to be good for you, Capernaum. You're rejecting Jesus Christ as the Messiah. You're rejecting him as to who he is. He's the Son of God, paid for your sins. You will be brought down to Hades. That's hell. And eventually, it's the lake of fire. Then in verse 16, he says, The one who listens to you, listen to this, the one who listens to you listens to me. Now, he's sending out his disciples two by two. 
And they're going out with this message, the kingdom message, the kingdom is near. You need to try, you need to understand Jesus is the Messiah of Israel. So he says, those who listen to you, listen to me. So Jesus is going to follow up. He's going to these cities also. He has a message. And what he's saying is, even though I'm not there, if they hear you, they hear you, it's the same as hearing me. And the one who rejects you, rejects me. Now, how about a, how about a, a contemporary application? I'm teaching the word of God. If you reject, and he said, and you reject, let's say you reject me. You reject what I'm saying. He said, if you reject Jim Bertel, you're actually rejecting me. And he said, but the one who rejects me rejects the one who sent me. So what it amounts to, people who, re, people who reject any person who's teaching the truth, preaching the truth, anyone who rejects that person is not only rejecting Christ, they're rejecting God. Do you think that's good news? I don't think so. Then he says the joyful results in verse 17. He sent these guys out. They've gone out and they've witnessed to the people who were there. And they came back with a good report. He said, now the 72 returned with joy. They were overjoyed. Because wherever they went, whenever, they, whenever they're preaching, many people had come to Christ. So these people come back to Jesus, the 72 of them, filled with joy, saying, Lord, you can, listen, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Now that's during that period of time, okay? And he said, and he said to them, Jesus says to them, I watch Satan fall from heaven like lightning. He said, behold... I have given you authority to walk on snakes and scorpions and authority over all the power of the enemy and nothing will injure you. He's talking to them. Nevertheless, he says, do not rejoice in this. <laughs> what, what are they rejoicing in? Oh, Lord, you, you can't believe it. Uh, we healed people. We casted out demons. We walked on snakes. Oh, we did all these things. Every place we went, we had the authority over all power of the enemy. Oh, boy, Lord, we're just so filled with joy. He said, nevertheless, do not rejoice in this. What? That the spirits, demonic spirits, are subject to you. In other words, they speak and the, and the demon goes, okay? So he says, nevertheless, do not rejoice in this. In other words, don't get puffed up about the fact that you have power over the devil, over the demons and the demonic world. No, don't do that. He said, but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. All right. Now, let me go back to our, our passage again. And we've just read the... Um, Luke chapter 10, down to verse 20. Now, having, re having received these people back from their missionary journey, when they're going out to teach the word of God, teach the gospel, the gospel of the kingdom, we get to verse 21, and it said, at that very time, Jesus rejoiced greatly in the Holy Spirit. Jesus is rejoicing over the fact that he sent these people out and there are people that are actually responding to the gospel of the kingdom. And Jesus, it says here that Jesus rejoiced greatly, not just a little bit, but he rejoiced greatly and said, I praise you, Father. Jesus is talking to God the Father now. He said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth. Why is he praising him? That you, Father, listen to this, please now. Listen to this. He said, I'm, I'm praising you, Father, Lord of heaven. This is actually after these, 20, uh, these 72 guys come back with good news about people receiving Jesus Christ as, their, as the Messiah. He said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven, that you have hidden these things. Wait a minute. Just a second. God has hidden certain things from people? He says, yes. He said, I am praising you, Father, that you have hidden these things. I've capitalized that, these things again. It's not that way in the scripture, 
but I capitalize it to call it to your attention that Jesus, that God the Father has hidden certain things called these things from the wise and intelligent and have real, revealed them, these things, whatever, whatever he's hidden from the wise and intelligent people, he's revealed them, these things, to infants. Now the question is, who are the wise and the intelligent and who are the infants? And Jesus goes on and makes this final statement, Yes, Father, for doing so was well-pleasing in your sight. Now, Jesus is praising God for having hidden certain things from the wise and the intelligent and revealed them to infants. We'll see who those are. And then he says, Not only am I rejoicing, Father, you see I'm rejoicing, I'm praising you. I'm rejoicing greatly over the fact that these people out here got saved believing that I am their Messiah. And he said, I, I realize, Father, that there are certain people out here who have rejected that message. He said, yes, Father, for doing so was well-pleasing in your sight. So even for the Father, God the Father, the author of all creation... God the Father was well pleased because certain people didn't hear and get the truth. Please listen to that. Jesus rejoiced, great, rejoiced greatly. And I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for doing so was well-pleasing in your sight. So it pleased God to hide something from the wise and intelligent persons. So in Luke 10, we have the 70 disciples, 72 of them, have just returned from their preaching tours and reported their success to Jesus. And in verse 21, saying that Jesus was rejoicing, and he was rejoicing greatly in the Spirit, the question is, what is it that Jesus was rejoicing about in this verse? What was he rejoicing about? Rejoicing greatly. Well, if we ask that question, what is it that Jesus is rejoicing about in this verse, in verse 21, we find, that we find the answer. Luke says that Jesus is rejoicing because God the Father had hidden certain things from the wise and intelligent and revealed them to infants, revealed the hidden things to infants. So that raises another question. How should we understand God the Father hiding things from the wise and intelligent and revealing the same hidden things to infants? Are you getting the picture? Do you have this stuck in your mind now? That God the Father is hiding certain things from intelligent and wise people? And yet revealing them? To a group of people that he calls infants? So how should we understand that God the Father is hiding these things for the intelligent and wise and, re and, hide and, and revealing them to infants? Here's the answer. When Jesus said that God has hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and revealed them to infants, he didn't mean, he didn't mean, no, no, hang on, he didn't mean that the wise or intelligent people will not be saved. But that those who lack intelligence, nor did he, did he mean the, the, the wise and intelligent, no, they, they can't be saved. But oh, hey, I'll tell you what, those who lack intelligence, oh yes, they'll be saved. That's not what he means here. So if that's not what he meant, if he didn't mean, hey, if you're intelligent and wise, you can't be saved. But I'll tell you what, you've got a low IQ, hey, yeah, it's okay, you'll be saved. He didn't mean that. So what did Jesus actually mean here? And here's the answer. Jesus was making a contrast between the intelligent and wise persons and infants, making a contrast. On one side, you got the intelligent and wise. On the other side, you got this infants, two different groups of people. And the contrast is between those people who arrogantly trust in their own reason and intellect. So what happens is we see that today. How many times do you see this today where you go out with a gospel message, a clear message from God, from the Word of God, 
It's absolutely true. It's absolutely correct. It couldn't be any more perfect than what it is. And you share that with somebody and they said, Puh, that's baloney. I don't believe that. I believe, I believe this. See, these people are arrogant. They're rejecting the word of God. They're rejecting God's plan. They're rejecting the wisdom of God. So these are the people who are the, who are the intellects. These are the people who are wise and intelligent. These are people who arrogantly trust in their own reason intellect, opposed to those people who humbly bow before God's revealed wisdom regarding Christ. Oh, yes, I see that. I'm not, oh, I, I can't say I've got a better idea, I've got a better plan out here. No, 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 no. No, can't do that. I hear you, Lord. I understand. You're the Son of God. You're the Messiah. Back at that point in time, he was the Messiah. He's the Messiah to Israel today. But he's the, he's the Messiah. But we're, we're believing in a grace message. This was a grace message also. But the question is, what are you believing? So these arrogant people, the wise and intelligent, see that? He's simply saying those people who are rejecting, based on the fact that they get a better idea, these are intelligent and wise people, and guess what? They don't have a clue. I'm hiding the truth from them. Now watch what he says. The humble people then are going to bow before God's revealed wisdom regarding Christ. So the truth of the matter is, if you want a good, a good illustration of this, you take people out here today who are rejecting Christ for who and what he is. These are the intelligent and wise people. They've got, an, they've got another answer out there. Well, who are the infants? That's you. That's me. Guess what we've done? We've come humbly before God and said, listen, I hear this. The Spirit of God is showing me that this is the Christ, the Son of the living God. He died. He was buried. He's resurrected on my behalf. I believe that. I accept that. See, there's the infants. So you got the arrogant and the humble people, the intelligent and the wise, and those infants who are coming along and saying, yes, I believe this. So question, another question. What does the proud man think? This is the arrogant people. This is the intelligent. This is the wise people. What do those people think? Well, the answer is simple. Proud people think that they can approach God in their own way. No, I don't need that. Listen, uh, I don't need that way. I'm going to come to him. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to find myself in heaven because this is what I'm doing. This is what I think. This is what I believe. See, proud people think they can approach God in their own way. On their own terms. This is my, listen God, I'm coming to you, but this is the way I'm going to do it. And through their own merits. Look Lord, look what I've done. Look at all these things I've helped these old ladies across the street. I've fed the poor. I've, I've gone out and preached your, preached your word. See, proud people think they can approach God in their own way, on their own terms, and through their own merits. But as Paul explained in 1 Corinthians chapter 121, listen to this now. We're going to, go, we're going to another passage of Scripture. Paul explains in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 21 that God will destroy the wisdom of the wise through the power of the message of the cross. The power of the message of the cross of Jesus Christ. The power of that message will overcome the wisdom of the wise. You don't have a message that will save you. You don't have a message that will turn your life around. That would be consistent with God's plan for your life. So proud people think they can approach God in their own way, on their own terms. But Paul is going to destroy that idea in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21. Listen to this. Paul says, For since in the wisdom of God... See, the wisdom of God was, back in our passage we just read, to hide to hide the, the truth from these, from these people who are wise and intelligent, what he called wise and intelligent. For since the wisdom of God... In the wisdom of God, the word through its wisdom did not come to know God. Stop and think about that. In the wisdom of God, 
you got God's wisdom. The world, through its wisdom, did not come to know God. So you got these wise people out there, these intelligent people out there, got all kinds of ideas. Oh, yes. Maybe there isn't even an eternity out there. I'm just going to die and that's, it's all over. Whatever their wisdom is, whatever their thinking is, until they come to Christ in the right way, it says God was pleased through the foolishness of the message preached. You know what the foolish message was? The death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In the age of grace, he's your Messiah. I mean, in the age of, uh, the age of Israel, it was, here's your Messiah. But for us today, it's the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's not the death, the burial, and the resurrection in baptism. It's not the death, burial, and resurrection speaking in tongues. It's not the death, burial, and resurrection and living a, a perfect life. That's not it. Jesus died, was buried, and resurrected. And you believe that? There's the humility. I'm, I'm, I come before you, Lord. I don't have enough. I don't have enough wisdom to come up with my own plan. Since the, in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God. God was pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. Let's look at this. Look at this verse. It says, "For since, since what? Well, for since." In the wisdom of God. Since what? Since the world through its own wisdom did not come to know God. For since the world through its wisdom did not come to know God. So here's the issue. If you added up all of the experience of the people of the world, let's just add up all of their experience. This guy did this, this guy did that, some, some lady did this, some other lady did this. You take all of this wisdom if you added up all the, uh, all the experience of the people of the world, it became clear that human beings would never, by their own wisdom, come to the truth and the true knowledge of God. And it pleased God to devise his own plan from man, for mankind's salvation. For sins. Now, let's go back to Luke 10, 21. See, we see in this, in this phrase, for sins... These people did not know God. So he's going to give this message out here, the death, the burial, and the resurrection. And people call that, that's a foolish kind of thing. No, no, that's not the way it is. So by that foolish message, God's going to confound the wise. So we want to go back to Luke ten twenty one again, where Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven, Lord of heaven and earth. I praise you that you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and have revealed them to infants. So the question, what is it that the Father hides from some and reveals to others? What is it that the Father hides from some and reveals to others? Well, the answer is found in Luke 10.22. We started out in 10.21. 10.21 says, I praise you, Father, You've hidden these things from the wise and intelligent. You revealed them to infants. Well, wait a minute, just a second. What is, what, Father, what is it you're hiding? Well, if we just read the next verse, Paul's go, uh, Luke is going to tell us, Luke's going to tell us what, what it is that was hidden. Luke 10, 22 gives the answer. No one knows the Son. Who is the Son? Now, let me say that. No one knows who the Son is except the Father. Listen to that. No one knows who the Son is except the Father. So what God the Father must reveal, see, He knows who it is. And unless He reveals it, no one else is going to know it. So what God the Father must reveal is the true spiritual identity of the Son of God. And when the 70 disciples, the 72 disciples returned from their evangelistic mission and gave their report to Jesus, Jesus rejoiced that God the Father had chosen, according to his own good pleasure, to reveal the Son to infants and hide them from the wise. Amazing. So the question is, what is the point here? What's the point that's trying to be made? 
The point is not that there are only certain classes of people who are chosen by God. The point is that God the Father is free to choose the least likely candidates, what God calls infants here, for his grace. See, God hides from the self-sufficient wise and reveals to the most helpless and unaccomplished. When Jesus sees the Father freely enlightening and saving people, whose only hope is free grace, see, grace is free. The provision of God is free. What happens? When Jesus sees the Father freely enlightening and saving people, whose only hope is free grace, what does Jesus do? He rejoices in the Holy Spirit and takes pleasure in his Father's election, those persons he chooses to save. So we have a conclusion here. So when we see this, in other words, when the light goes on in your head, when the light goes on in your mind, when we know that we are among God's chosen children, guess what we do? We join in the rejoicing. Paul also knows how to suffer. We saw last Sunday the suffering of Jesus. But now we see that Paul also knows great suffering. This is the Apostle Paul. Right now, while he's writing to the Philippians, he's in, he's in prison in Rome. Jesus knew great suffering, but so did the Apostle Paul. Remember again, Jesus is suffering because of who he said he is. Paul is suffering because he, he is saying who Jesus is. You're going to suffer because you're going to tell people who Jesus is. Not, all, not every occasion, but you're going to run into opposition when you begin to tell people who this Jesus is. In 2 Corinthians chapter, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 24 to 28, Paul is going to, to recount his own struggles in his own ministry. Jesus suffered because of who he is. Paul is going to suffer because of what he said Jesus is. So here's what Paul tells us about his suffering. He said, five times I received from the Jews, listen to me please, five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. What that means is, you took Paul, you bent him, bent him over, get him laying out there, get his back showing, and you take this whip and you you whip him. And under the, under the law, 39 lashes is the most you can give him. Can you imagine this? Somebody laying you on your on your abdomen, face down, taking a whip, and generally speaking, it's got metal, stones in the whip. And they flog you 39 times. Once, twice, three times. Can you imagine the suffering that Paul went through? Why? Because he believed that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. He was given a message by Jesus Christ, from Jesus Christ. To give to you and me. That you and I might be saved. By believing solely in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So Paul is beaten five different times. With 39 lashes. Three times he said I was beaten with rods. He said once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have spent adrift at the sea. I have been on frequent journeys in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, 
So it didn't make any difference whether it was a Gentile or a Jew. They were, they were both after Paul. Dangers in the city. Dangers in the wilderness. Dangers at sea. Dangers among false brothers. <laughs> People who claim to be something that they're not. He said, I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And apart from such external things, the external, I mean, it's things coming at Paul from the outside. He said, I also have an inner problem, something on the inside. He said, there is the daily pressure on me of concern for all the churches. That is the assemblies, the assemblies of, of people who come together to worship. Now he says, now I say, now note this. Here's something we want to note. In spite of all those painful struggles, should we go back and read them again? I don't think it's necessary. In spite of all those painful struggles, Paul issues this command from a prison cell. And here's what he says. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. That's under any circumstance in your life. Good, bad, right, wrong, or indifferent. Rejoice. So let's turn, let, let's take a look now and see our turn. What we've seen is the sufferings of Jesus last week. We've seen the sufferings of Paul right here. Now it's our turn. Let's turn our eyes on ourselves. Not Jesus, not Paul, but turn your eyes on yourself. Philippians 4, 4 says rejoice. This is a command. It's not just rejoice one time. Keep on rejoicing. Keep on rejoicing. So that what we see then in your Christian life, uh, and my mind, my mind races back, through all those years when I, I finally saw that Jesus had died for my sins, was buried and resurrected. And John Goat is standing in front of me. I'm sitting in the choir at the Navy Chapel. And John Goat is preaching the gospel. The first time in my life, 27 years of age, first time in my life where I ever heard the gospel one time. And when he preached the gospel that day, I knew absolutely well I needed what he was talking about. But from that time on, I had to be pointed in a direction where I was going to get the kind of truth that was going to lead me into the path that God wants me on in my daily Christian life. Because basically, pastors at that point in time when I was under their ministry, was not teaching me how to live the Christian way of life. As a matter of fact, most of those pastors could never get out of the Gospels. Never get out of the Gospels. And while there are promises and principles that are universal there, they do not contain the rules that guide my Christian life or yours. So Paul says to you and me, rejoice that means keep on rejoicing and it is a command and if we're not rejoicing in all things guess what we're doing we're breaking the command and if you're breaking the command you're out of fellowship with god period and this is why we have to learn operation rebound and operation cry we call that operation recovery how do you recover from lost fellowship well you name your sin or sins, the known sins. When you name the known sins, he forgives the known and the unknown. And then you, you function in Operation Cry, no reckon, reckon, and yield. And when you yield to God the Holy Spirit, 
your neutral man or woman makes the makes the yieldedness to God the Holy Spirit. You're back in the sphere of the Spirit and you're now functioning where you need to be in the Christian way of life. So rejoicing, according to Paul, is our Christian duty. It's a command. And here's what rejoicing implies. Rejoicing implies the following things. We should rejoice that we have a Savior. How would you like for someone to come to you and say, uh, you know, God's got a plan for your life, and you need to be what we're calling saved. And if you're not saved, you're going to spend eternity separated from God. You'll be in the lake of fire forever. Nothing good ever happening there. You can't get out. The, the greatest torture is being separated from the God of all creation. So we should, we should rejoice. Why should you rejoice? Well, one of the things we ought to rejoice about is that we have a Savior. So when we think about and consider our sins, we can rejoice that there is one who can and has already delivered us from our sins. Hmm. When we think of the worth of our soul, body, soul, and spirit, the body is the outer part here that houses the spirit and the soul. We don't have a human spirit until we're saved. You have a soul. The soul is the real you. Take the body, take the soul, take the spirit away, take the body and the spirit away. Guess what? The soul is the real you. And the real you, your soul, is going to live forever. It'll live in the presence of God. Or it's going it, to it's going to live throughout all of eternity, separated from the eternal God of all creation. So there's a choice. Live with him or live without him. So the worth of the soul. When we think of the worth of our soul, the, wor the soul is the real you. It's, it's the real us. We're able to rejoice that there is one who can save our soul from the second death, eternal separation from God. So when you begin to think that you have this soul, it's the real you. And the real you is going to spend eternity with God or is going to spend eternity away from God. So when you realize the worth of your soul, your, your soul is worth something. It's the real you. We're able to rejoice that there is one who can save our soul from the second death, which is eternal separation from God. And when we think of, the, of personal danger, we can rejoice that there is one who can rescue us from all peril. And bring us into a world where we can be safe, not just for a little while, but be safe forever. What else can we do? Rejoicing is our Christian duty. And rejoicing implies the following things. We can rejoice that we have such a Savior. Now listen, point one, the first one, we should rejoice. We should Point number two says not we shouldn't not that can, not that you can not that you should. But the second point is we can rejoice that we have a savior. You see, Jesus is the type of savior that we need, one who can save us from our sins, someone who can provide for us all that we need. He accomplishes what we want a savior to do. Jesus accomplished it. What do you want? What do you want your Savior to do? You see, we need a Savior to make known to us a way of pardon. Oh yeah, you you you, you wake up one day and you say, "Oh, I've got all these sins in my life. I need a Savior. What can I do? What what should my Savior do for me?" Well, we need a Savior that can make known to us a way of pardon, and He did. It's through the cross. We need a Savior that can make an atonement for our sin. And he did. We need a Savior who can give us peace from a troubled conscience. And he did. When you just look at those three things, 
pardoning us from sin, making an atonement for sin, giving peace to a troubled conscience. See, this is why when you're taking a look at all these pressures in your life and your conscience is troubled, I'm worried, not sure, I feel so guilty. See, we need a Savior that can give us peace from troubled conscience. And He does. And this is why I've indicated many, many times to people out there who are looking at their past and seeing what their past is like, Jesus has paid for all that. We can have a, a conscience that's free from all this trouble. Well, Lord, I can't help it. I just, I just, it keeps coming up. No, guess what he did? He's able to give us peace for our troubled conscience. We need a Savior that can support, support us in trials and bereavements. you got this pressure here. you got that pressure there. you got this, something happened over here. Oh, I've lost my wife. I've lost my mother. I've lost my dad. The kids are gone. I've got all the, I'm just so troubled, Lord. We need a Savior who can support us in our trials and our bereavements. And guess what he does? We need a Savior who can support us on our deathbed and guide us through the dark valley of death. And the Lord is just what we need. He's able to do all this. Well, he's not working. It's, no, 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 no. Here's the issue. You take this and apply it and it works. When we look at Jesus, when we look at his character, sell junior new life, sovereignty, eternal life, love, justice, absolute righteousness, omnipotence, omniscience, omnipresence, immutability, and veracity. When we look at his character and understand sell junior new life, it's just what we need to encourage us to love him. He has it all, and he's made provision for us. When we look at what he has done, we see what he's accomplished. Everything we could desire, he's already provided it. He's made it available. Therefore, why should we not rejoice? We see all this. Why should we not rejoice? In fact, we should rejoice in him. And first in order of things that brings rejoicing is to know that we are in the Lord. You are in the Lord. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Believe his death, his, in his death, his burial, his resurrection. You're saved eternally. The very first thing that, that the Holy Spirit does when you believe in Jesus is take you out of Adam and place you in Christ. Two circles. Two circles. In Adam, in Christ. You're lost. You're on your way to hell in the lake of fire. You've got an old sin nature. You're living by it. You're in the devil's world. You're Falling into, his, falling into his plan, doing his things for you. And guess what? You believe in Jesus, the Holy Spirit picks you up, takes you, takes you out, of there, out of Adam and places you in Christ. You didn't know it, you didn't feel it, but when you come to the Word of God and realize this, in fact, we should rejoice in him and, the fir and first in order of things that brings rejoicing is to know that we are in him, we are positionally sanctified set apart from Adam into Christ. That's our position. You see, regenerate Christians will not find true happiness and riches. Oh, no, no. Please. If I just had more money, if I just had more pleasures, or vanity, or ambition, or books, or in the world in any form, we will not find real happiness. But true happiness is found in fellowship of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what that means? It means we have to be saved. We have to learn how to get back in fellowship once we lose our fellowship with him. And when you find yourself in Christ Jesus, you find yourself in fellowship with him, we find a, listen, we find a, Confident assurance of eternal life. I was talking to someone the other day and said to them, do you know whether or not you 
will go to heaven when you die. And they sort of looked at me a little sheep, sheepishly and said, you know, I'm not really sure. We see what happens. They don't have the confident assurance that they will be saved for an eternity. If they have trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior, believed in his death, burial, and resurrection, there, there should be a total confidence that they have eternal salvation. That they will always be in the presence of God. But why don't, why don't we believe that? It's because we're not certain of the things we believe or we haven't been told the truth. Whoop, whoop, I'm sorry. It's, it's 9.16. Well, I'll stop right here. Let me mark my notes. I'm going to mark there so, to pick, the, pick them up this coming Sunday. And remember now, Sir Darrell will be with us this, this Wednesday again, teaching in the book of Galatians. What a book that is. And I will be back on uh, the following Sunday next week and the following Wednesday thereafter, as long as the Lord uh, is willing. So with your head bowed and eyes closed, Father, thank you this morning for goodness gracious sakes alive. Hiding, hiding the truth about who this Jesus is from the wise and intelligent. And in taking people like me and others, calling us infants, because we're not arrogant, we don't have our own plan, we don't have our own way. We know that none, none of that will work. So we believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. We know what he did for us. And so we realize that, according to the Apostle Paul, our responsibility is to rejoice in all things. And again, I say rejoice. Father, what a plan. I pray that We've allowed the Spirit of God to illuminate our mind, to teach the meaning of this. And I pray, Father, we reflect on our own lives individually and ask, are we really rejoicing in all things or not? A solid witness, Father, is going to be founded on whether we're able to rejoice in all things or not. Because just about the time I'm telling somebody about Jesus and they see that I'm worried about something, whatever it might be. Uncertainty. I don't whether I want to believe in a Jesus like that or not. So give us the confident assurance, Father, that we can do all these things, rejoicing in all situations of life, and we'll praise you for it. In Christ's name, amen. God bless all of you. Thank you for being with me today. Look forward to being back with you next Sunday and then the following Wednesdays. Look forward to seeing you on Wednesday night with Daryl. God bless you and good day.